Recently, I received a box of Commodore 64 items from a friend. Not as big as Nathan's stash, but still decent. Included were the C64, a cassette tape drive, tapes, and several magazines. Upon power-up, however, it booted and ran for about 30 seconds, then the power indicator began to fade away. I spent some time troubleshooting voltages, checking continuity on, on the wires from the power connector back into the power supply, and making the power cable ugly in the process. Everything seemed to check out correctly. However, after a bit of, a bit of Google foo, <laughs> I discovered that one voltage was indeed out of tolerance. Initially, I suspected that the 5.29 to 5.3 volts that I was reading on the DC voltage supplied by the power supply was within tolerance of the required 5 volts DC. However, this is above the expected tolerance of plus or minus 2% of 5 volts. The 5 volt line on a C64 should not go above 5.1 volts and it should not drop under 4.9 volts. Luckily, I was later able to test my C64 main unit with a friend's known good power supply and the computer itself had survived the over voltage my power supply had delivered to it. The C64 power supply is a bit unconventional compared to most other 1980s 8-bit computers and video game consoles, most of which output a single voltage and current type to the computer. For example, the Atari 400-800 runs on 9.5 volts AC, the Atari 2600 VCS on 9 volts DC, and the Nintendo NES on 9 volts AC. The fact that a Commodore 64 power supply sends two different power feeds to the main computer unit, 9 volts alternating current and 5 volts direct current, makes simply purchasing an aftermarket power supply for a C64 more challenging of a task than for most other home computers and game consoles of the same vintage. I spent some time looking for, for new C64 power supplies online, and there is at least one person building them, but they cost a pretty good sum of money, usually $50 or more. Not wanting to invest that much in a computer I would only tinker with on rare occasion, I chose to explore repairing the power supply I had. Now, there's an unfortunate caveat to repairing C64 power supplies, which some of you may already know. A large number of power supply versions were filled with this ridiculous epoxy that completely filled the brick. In fact, the majority of the power supplies were manufactured in this manner. If you can chip the epoxy away from everything, you could presumably do the repair we're going to discuss. But in all honesty, this epoxy will likely be very difficult to chip away and remove from all the components. Luckily, the power supply I have, while being branded Commodore, was of a different design that was not filled with anything except the electronic components involved. Let's examine the design theory of a Commodore 64 power supply. The power supply is made up of a single transformer, plugged into a standard 110 volt alternating current, in the US anyway. This transformer provides a couple of taps, access to the transformer's windings that provide various voltages transformed from the 110 volts AC feed. The first tap provides 9 volts to pins 6 and 7 on the Commodore 64 7 pin DIN plug. The current, just like the wall receptacle current coming to the transformer, is alternating current, or AC, and changes direction of flow back and forth rapidly on the two wires, thus its name, alternating current. The other AC transformer tap output is fed into a pair of diodes, which creates the start of a half-wave DC rectifier circuit. A diode will only allow current to flow in one direction, so the diode only passes current through when it's flowing in the diode's forward direction. Each time the current alternates direction ahead of the pair of diodes, only the current heading in the direction of a diode is passed on to the circuit beyond the diode, thus converting the current flow from alternating to direct current, or DC. So now we have approximately 18 volts of direct current electricity flowing toward our Commodore 64 on its positive direct current line connected to pin 5, and we expect that to come back to the power supply from the C64 on pin 2, the negative or ground line. But wait, we need 5 volts of direct current, not 18. 18 volts when we need 5 will let out the C64's magic smoke and all will be lost. 
That's where this component comes in, a linear voltage regulator integrated circuit. This is the component that begins to fail to function correctly in so many Commodore power supplies. This integrated circuit component takes a DC voltage anywhere between 8 and 45 volts on pin 2 and outputs 5 volts on pin 1. Excess electricity is converted to heat. The issue with the regulators used in these power supplies, this 3052P or NTE 1934 regulator IC, is that they begin to fail high, meaning that the regulated voltage begins to float upward from a steady 4.9 to 5.1 volts to 5.2, 5.3, 5.4 volts, and so on. Not good for delicate circuitry. A quick study of my power supply showed that it indeed had an ECG 1934, also known as an NTE 1934 regulator. Nathan had suggested, had suggested using two of the most common and well-known 5-volt linear regulators, the LM7805, which is a 1-amp regulator. As the C64 draws about 1.2 amps, the two 7805s wired in parallel is a viable solution. In fact, Nathan has an aftermarket power supply that uses this configuration. However, due to my desire to keep the, with the KISS principle in this situation, keep it simple, stupid, for those uh, not in the know, I very much desired to try to stick as close as possible to the circuit already in the power supply I have, so I decided to go the route of finding a viable replacement individual voltage regulator that had the proper ratings to work in the circuit. I started out by looking for the actual failed IC in the power supply, the NTE 1934. I located a few places selling them, but at a rather high price for an individual component, more than $12. To put this in perspective, the LM7805 sells for something like 50 cents each on a good day. Really though, who wants to replace a component that was known to fail with the same exact part? In the 37 years since the C64 was introduced, surely there had been more reliable voltage regulator ICs designed. I decided to explore what else was available on the electronic components market. To begin my search, I found and studied the data sheet for the NTE 1934 regulator. A data sheet is a document published for an electronic component that describes its functionality and all its various details one would need to know for using it in a project or, in our case, as a replacement component. The key things we need to know for finding a replacement regulator are the following. The DC input voltage range to make sure it can accept the amount of voltage coming in from the rectifier and the strength of current it can supply, which is its rated amperage. From the NTE 1934 data sheet, we see that the original component's amperage rating is 2 amps. This means the device that is powering can draw up to 2 amps of current before the regulator begins to fold back its output voltage due, the, due to the overdrawing of current. This is in line with the C64 drawing up to 1.2 amps of power. More is better in this case. We need a regulator that can supply more than 1.2 amps. Next, we see that the original component can support up to 45 volts input, although this is the absolute maximum, which would not be ideal long term. If we look in this table below that, we see that the regulator will supply a steady voltage most comfortably with between 30 and 8 volts coming to it. If we look back at our schematic, we see that the maximum voltage we could have from our transformer tap is 18 volts. Any regulator that can accept that voltage input is acceptable. Finally, let's look at the output voltage, which is the main goal. Its minimum should be no less than 4.9 volts, while its maximum should be no more than 5.1 volts. Typical should be 5.0 volts. I began to look at the at uh, various 5 volt regulator ICs online, and I soon discovered the Texas Instruments LM1084. The LM1084 comes in a few versions, including one with an adjustable output voltage. However, we will be working with the fixed 5 volt output voltage version. On the LM1084 data sheet, we see that it is capable of supplying up to 5 amps of current. While maintaining the output voltage range we require, anywhere between 4.9 and 5.1 volts. It accepts an input voltage of up to 25 volts, and we are keeping under that at 18 volts. The 5 amps is more than enough headroom for the 1.2 amps the C64 draws. Best of all, it costs a mere $2.60. I know that some of you might know that there are some other Texas Instruments regulators available in this series, which are physically identical, but have lower current delivery ability. There's the LM1083, which is a 3 amp version, as well as the LM1086, which can deliver a maximum of 1.5 amps. Either of these should also work in this particular application. 
Let's take a look at the actual power supply hardware. The existing voltage regulator circuit is mounted in a single PCB, which sits in a metal enclosure. The existing NTE 1934 regulator is bolted to this enclosure. The metal enclosure is acting as what, as what is called a heat sink. The byproduct of the voltage conversion in the voltage regulator is heat. The regulator gets quite hot as it does its job, and without a heat sink, its ability to convert voltage drops significantly. The regulator will fold back its voltage as a means of overdraw protection if its temperature rises too high. If you've ever noticed how a wall warp power supply feels warm to the touch, or have wondered why computer power supplies need cooling fans, voltage regulation generates heat and is the reason. The white material behind the NT1934 is thermal compound that helps conduct heat from the regulator to the metal it is attached to. Let's look at the pinout of the original NTE 1934 component. Pin 1, looking at it from the front, is the voltage output, VO, or the 5 volt power going to the load, which is the C64 in this case. Pin 2 is where the incoming higher voltage, VN, from the rectifier enters the regulator, and pin 3 is connected to the circuit ground. The regulator circuit board in the power supply has pins 1, 2, and 3 marked on it, and a study of the traces on the board verify that the numbers do indeed match the information in the NTE 1934 datasheet. Now, let's examine the pinout of the LM1084 IC. Pin 1 is ground, pin 2 is 5 volt output, and pin 3 is the incom incoming voltage. Do you see the issue we have here? Every pin is mapped to something different on the LM1084 IC compared to the NTE 1934 it will replace. We will have to stub it with extension wires to adapt it to the PCB. Luckily, the LM1084 IC is quite a bit smaller than the NTE 1934 IC we are replacing, so using extension, extension wires is considerably easier than it would be otherwise. I selected solid copper CAT5E Ethernet cable strands for making my extension wires, as this is something I had available and on hand. After carefully soldering these wires, these small wires, through the holes the original regulator had been mounted in, soldered the wires to the LM1084 pins as follows. LM1084 pin 1 to hole 3, LM1084 pin 2 to hole 1, and LM1084 pin 3 to hole 2. Here's a graphic to help make sense of this. It might help to pause here and take a screenshot. Keep in mind that the LM1084 will be facing the opposite direction as in this graphic when you wire it into this particular model of power supply. If your regulator board differs from mine, just make sure that you're connecting each pin to the, on the LM1084 to the same spot the pin with the same function on the NTE1934 was connected. So voltage in matches voltage in, ground matches ground, and voltage out matches voltage out. Here's what mine looked like attached. Make sure the wires will not touch in any way, especially if you push the regular down toward the PCB a bit. You'll need to do this to reinstall it. You'll want to get a little thermal paste to put on the back of the LM1084 and then reattach it using the screw and nut from the original NTE 1934 and tightly secure it to the metal heat sink enclosure, being careful to not allow the pins or wires attaching it to the PCB to touch. Before you fully reassemble, test the voltage between pins 5 and 2 on the power plug of the power supply to verify the voltage is now in tolerance. It should read no more than 5.1 volts and no less than 4.9 volts. It may read on the high side of the tolerance as the regular is not under any load while it is detached from the Commodore 64. Finally, carefully reassemble the power supply and have fun retro computing with your working Commodore 64. We'd love to know if this video helped you complete your repair of a Commodore 64 power supply. If so, drop us a comment below or email us at thedudes at 3 oldtechdudescom find us on Twitter at 3 oldtechdudes one or on Facebook at facebook.com slash 3 oldtechdudes Until next time, I'm Justin. I'm Nathan. And I'm Timmy. And this... It's three old tape. Plugged into standard 110 volt alternating current.